Hi, everyone. Uh, we are finishing up week five of Drugs and Behavior by talking about mood disorders and treatments. And for those who are interested in learning more about different types of psychological disorders and treatments, you are in luck. Uh, we will finish up the semester uh, by talking next week in week six about anxiety disorders. And we'll also be talking about antipsychotics, which are typically used for treating schizophrenia. So, oh, oh my gosh, that was far too fast. Uh, I am very surprised that that happened. So um, here's kind of our overview for what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to talk about the characteristics of mood, um, also known as affective disorders, that is affective with an A. Um, we'll talk about some of the different neural and chemical mechanisms behind why mood disorders happen. We'll talk about some different neurobiological models of depression and why it happens. And then we'll finish up by talking about the various drugs that are used to treat mood disorders. So what do we know about mood disorders? So if you've taken a psychology class um, such as what used to be called abnormal psychology, which is often going to be referred to as psychological disorders these days, you would know that when we talk about different types of mental disorders or psychological disorders, these are often going to be disorders that ultimately impair our daily functioning. Um, and they're also causing us a lot of stress in our lives. And so for something to truly be considered a mood disorder, we're going to notice extreme changes in mood that cause us dysfunction. They hurt our ability to be able to do our jobs effectively, um, maintain our different social relationships effectively, and are ultimately hurting our health and our well being. So, mood disorders are largely going to be marked by extreme changes in mood. Now, there are several other types of mood disorders um, that we're not really going to discuss today. So, we're not really going to talk about seasonal affective disorder. Uh, we're not going to talk about um, things like postpartum depression. And that's largely because many of the things that we see in some of these other disorders look very similar to the two major mood disorders that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about major depression, which is also referred to as unipolar depression. Um, and the Cliff's Notes version, and we'll go into deeper detail about the diagnostic criteria, uh, you're going to have recurring episodes of dysphoria, so just emotionally not feeling well, depressed mood, feelings of guilt, worthlessness, and also a lot of negative thinking. Now, bipolar disorder is marked by depressive episodes that... Um, after uh, periods where there is no depression may potentially swing into a manic episode, which is abnormally elevated mood. Now, one of the things that I think is really important to mention is that there is a difference between the feelings that you have in response to what's going on in your life uh, versus um, what would qualify as depression. So to be very clear, you are going to feel down and blue. You might feel listless and you might lack the energy that you need uh, to do the things that you enjoy. However, sometimes these kind of changes are in response to things that are going on in your life, such as uh, losing a loved one, either through things like breakups, divorces, death, etc., cetera, um, loss of a job, um, or failure to reach goals that you were really passionate about and wanted to succeed at. Depressed mood in response to these events is normal. It is expected that you will feel bad when these things happen. And so sometimes this is referred to as reactive depression. And this technically does not 
constitute mental illness. However, if symptoms are disproportionate to the event, or if they are ex significantly prolonged to the point where they are causing us dysfunction and stress and are potentially distressing to us, that's when we need to consider that what we might be feeling might actually be a major depressive episode. So what is major depression? Major depression is characterized by a loss of interest in nearly everything. And the technical term for this is anhedonia. Um, now this part is really important. Um, anhedonia is, is really kind of the critical thing here. If you're not a huge fan of school, and you're feeling so bad that you don't want to go to school when it was not all of that interesting to you, that wouldn't necessarily be a warning sign. You've already indicated you don't like school all that much. However, if there's something that you do that you always make time for, for example, I am very involved with things like community theater. If I suddenly no longer want to do that, because of my depressed mood, that is a red flag. So it, it's got to be lack of interest in the things that you're normally interested in. Beyond that, um, there's hopelessness, sadness, worthlessness, guilt, senses of desperation, uh, potentially eating too much or eating too little, um, sleeping too much or sleeping too little, um, crying and tearfulness, uh, diminished sexual desire, loss of ambition, fatigue. Um, and so, it, and sometimes this can actually manifest as physical pain. Um, it can also manifest as digestive issues and potentially even having difficulty breathing. Now, at its most severe and at its worst, it can lead to suicidal ideation. And one estimate of suicide rates does suggest that about 7 to 15% of people struggling with depression die by suicide compared to a rate of about 1 to 1.5% in the general population. So there is potentially an increased risk of dying by suicide. Now here, um, I want to talk um, about the diagnostic uh, symptoms of major depressive disorder. So this comes from the DSM-5, which was published in 2013. You're going to have five or more of the following, and they have to be present during the same two-week period. Now, this is the part about depression that always surprises me. This does not have to be a significantly prolonged period. It could be a two-week period when you are feeling these things, and it has to represent a change from previous functions. And at least one of the symptoms has to either be a depressed mood or a loss of interest or pleasure. So here are some of those different things. So you have a depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, either through subjective reports or observations made by others. Sometimes in children and adolescents, this manifests as irritable mood. Um, again, that anhedonia, diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, nearly every day. And again, this can either be through subjective report or through observations by others. Um, significant weight loss when not dieting or a weight gain. Uh, critically, this has to be about a change of more than 5% of your body weight in a month, decrease or increase in appetite nearly every day, insomnia, sleeping too little, or hypersomnia nearly every day, um, psychomotor agitation or retardation every day. This has to be uh, observable by others. This can't just be subjective feelings of restlessness or being slowed down. Fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt nearly every day. Not merely self-reproach or guilt about being sick. 
Diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day. Uh, recurrent thoughts of death, not just a fear of dying. Recur recurrent suicidal ideation without a plan or a suicide attempt or a plan that is specific for committing suicide. Now, in addition to those five that you have to demonstrate in the same two week period, these need to be clinically significant and there needs to be um, or there needs to be some type of impairment in social functioning, your job or other things. And here's what's really critical. These can't be happening due to the effects of a drug or another substance or another medical condition. So for example, sometimes with things like Alzheimer's disease, you will potentially experience a depressed mood, but that is not making Alzheimer's disease a mental disorder. That's because Alzheimer's disease has an organic physical cause. So we can't be having these symptoms due to organic causes like drugs or other medical conditions. Now, one of the things that we know about depression is that there is a very strong comorbidity. Comorbidity is a term that basically means that it often co-occurs with other types of psychological disorders. And, um, one of the things that has been very well documented is that there is an overlap with anxiety and alcohol dependency. And the comorbidity of uh, depression, basically two or more disorders occurring in the same individual is about 60%. And generally what we are gonna find is that depression is especially comorbid with an anxiety disorder. Um, in particular, generalized anxiety disorder is gonna be more common. Um, social anxiety is also very common and usually it's been noted that these anxious um, things that we see, the hallmarks of these anxiety disorders, actually end up coming before depression. And additionally, comorbidity actually will predict more severe symptoms. So if you have comorbid disorders like de depression and anxiety, you're probably going to have both of those more severely than if you had either depression on its own or an anxiety disorder on its own. Now, if depression is left untreated, um, so there's no medication that's being taken, there's no therapy that is being done, um, an episode is gonna last about six to nine months, um, but we do know that episodes can recur throughout life, and often they are going to increase in their frequency and their intensity, particularly later on in life. Now, let's talk a little bit about the demographics of affective disorders. Um, so one of the things that we know, particularly with depression, it's believed that about 15 to 20 percent, so there's a lifetime risk of 15 to 20 percent. Um, your textbook says 15 percent, others put it between 15 and 20 percent, but basically that is your lifetime risk of developing uh, depressive symptoms at any given point. Um, now, the risk for depression is slightly higher for women than it is for men. It's about three to four percent for men. It's about five to nine percent for women. Um, additionally, what we know is that the mean age of onset um, has historically been about 27 years, but particularly in the 1990s and moving forward, um, we have found that Americans in particular are developing major depression at higher rates than previously and at younger ages. So here you're looking at some data from a 1995 study. Um, and basically what you're kind of seeing here, um, this particular study um, looked at 18,000 subjects at five different sites, and they were basically grouped in cohorts based on their year of birth. Now you can see that this really isn't a very good grouping procedure, um, and that's largely because they've lumped 1955, so basically 
This was 1995, so basically anybody in their late 30s and younger. Um, and the reason I say 30 and not 40 is that odds are pretty good this data was collected before the publication date. So we're going to assume at the very latest that this data was collected in 1994. So that's basically people in their late 30s. These are people who are uh, born between 1945 and 54, 35 and 44, 25 through 1934, 15 through 24, 05 to 14, and anybody who was born before 1905. And what you're looking at on your y-axis is the cumulative rates of major depressive disorder and on our x-axis we're looking at age of onset. Now one of the things that you will kind of notice is that the older that you get the greater likelihood it is that you will develop depression. Um, what is especially interesting is that for most people you can see that that age of onset is generally going to be pretty low. You start to see some rising around 35, particular, particularly for this group of cohorts. Um, but what's interesting is that basically from 1935 on, you can see that first incidence and age of onset is in uh, is basically getting younger and younger and younger. Um, and so that's something to kind of be aware of. Now, bipolar disorder is going to be a little bit different. So with bipolar disorder, you are going to get alterate, alternations of depressive and manic episodes. You are also going to have some instances of what's basically time when you're neither depressive or manic. Your textbook refers to this as euthymia. It's basically your factory settings. You can kind of think of it that way. Um, the primary symptom of mania is elation, but we're not talking about about people just being happy. We're not talking about somebody like me who is very bubbly and energetic. This is how I am pretty much all of the time. We are talking about abnormally elevated mood. Um, above and beyond what you usually see with this person. So the primary symptom is going to be elation. They're going to have a lot of energy. They're not going to require a lot of sleep. They have a high sense of self-confidence and they have a lot of impulsivity. So it's not that uncommon to see things like bad business investments, reckless driving, um, shopping sprees that are spending thousands upon thousands of dollars or having a lot of risky sex with a lot of different partners. Um, so here are some of the different symptoms of a manic episode um, so that you can see those as well. And once again, these are coming from the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So we have a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood, an abnormally and persistently increased goal-directed activity or energy lasting at least one week and present most of the day, nearly every day, or any duration if hospitalization is necessary. So during this at least one week period. You have to have three or more of the following, but you have to have four if the mood is only irritable and they have to be present to a significant degree. And remember, they have to represent a noticeable change from usual behavior. So inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, they feel rested maybe only after three hours, more talkative than usual, or they feel a lot of pressure to keep talking, their ideas fly by, uh, they have the subjective experience that their thoughts are racing, very easily distractible, um, increase in goal-directed activity or psychomotor agitation, excessive involvement in activities that have high potential for painful consequences, unrestrained buying sprees, sexual indiscretions, foolish business investments, and the like. Um, the mood disturbance is sufficiently severe to cause marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or needing hospitalization to prevent harm to self or others or if you have psychotic features like hallucinations or significant delusions. Um, additionally, once again, the episode cannot be attributed <laughs> attributable to the effects of a drug. So if you're taking cocaine and a lot of this stuff is happening, this is not 
Um, bipolar disorder. This is not a manic episode. This is what cocaine occasionally does. Um, a medication or other treatment or to another medical condition. So what sort of things cause mood disorders? And we know a couple of different things. Odds are pretty good. You are pretty well aware that mood disorders do tend to run in families. For example, both anxiety disorders and depression does run in my mother's side of the family. Um, and that may be true for one of your sides of the family as well. But here's the thing, genes on their own do not really do anything unless they incur within a certain type of environment. So having these genes, you do have a vulnerability to it. However, having those genes does not mean that you are guaranteed to develop depression, um, but it means that being exposed to different types of environmental events might make you more likely to, to have this disorder if you are vulnerable to it. And there's really strong evidence for a genetic component here. So we know a couple of different things. First of all, people have looked at adoption studies. Um, this is a case where we look at children who are adopted and we compare um, the rate of disorders for both the biological family and for the adoptive family. Um, and what's kind of interesting is that adoption studies haven't really, um, the results haven't been as consistent as you would expect. Um, you would think that children who are adopted would more resemble their biological family. That hasn't always been the case. We have stronger data in what are known as twin studies. So twin studies are basically, we are looking at um, what is called concordance. What this basically means is that if I have a twin and I have a disorder, what is the likelihood that the other twin will have that disorder? And we look at two different types of twins. We look at what are called monozygotic twins. These are twins that come from the same egg. And as a result, they are what are known as identical twins. Identical twins or monozygotic twins share 100% of the same genes. Now, on the other hand, you can have what are called dizygotic or fraternal twins. These are twins that come from different eggs and as a result, they only share 50% of the same genes very similar to the genes that you share with your siblings. Um, if you have a full-blooded sibling, you share 50% of their genes. Uh, for those who are curious, if you have a half-sibling, you have about 25%, which basically puts them on a similar level as your grandparents. But Getting back to monozygotic versus dizygotic twins, we do actually find that if one monozygotic twin has a mood disorder, the likelihood of the other twin having a mood disorder is about 65%. So we're talking specifically about depression here. Um, for dizygotic twins, the rate's about 20%. If we go to bipolar disorder, this genetic link is even stronger. For monozygotic twins, there is an 80% concordance rate. There's an 80% chance that if your identical twin has bipolar disorder, you have an 80% chance of having it as well. Um, for dizygotic twins, the concordance rate for bipolar disorder is actually closer to 16%. So that really shows that bipolar has a much stronger uh, genetic link than depression does. But what you also need to note here is that while genes do play a role, none of those concordance rates are 100%, meaning that something else must be going on besides genetics. So here you are actually looking at the different concordance rates for identical twins versus uh, fraternal twins. And unfortunately, because of the way that I designed this, um, it cut off the 80% here, but that's that bipolar concordance that I mentioned. Now, if it's any mood disorder, 
It's about um, a little over 60% for identical twins here in blue versus about 20% for um, dizygotic twins or fraternal twins. For severe depression, the concordance rate is about less than 60% for um, identical twins. And interestingly enough, um, closer to 30% for uh, fraternal twins. But when we go to just regular depression, it's not that severe. Um, you can see that the concordance rate drops, really indicating that yes, genetics play a role. However, environment seems to matter as well. So one of the other things that we know that can be a really big factor in terms of whether or not depression develops is stress. So um, anxiety and depression are really closely related to each other. Um, so anxiety has really strong physiological symptoms like sympathetic nervous system activation. And oftentimes we're gonna find that it's going to occur with depression and strong environmental stress and anxiety might precede depressive episodes. Now, one of the things that we do need to talk about a little bit is that while anxiety and depression may occur together, um, and while the environment certainly plays a role in basically having these stressful events like folks, there is nobody on this earth who is going to have a life free of stress. If you are a human being, if you are here on this earth, you will experience stress at some point. And every single one of us has differences in terms of how we cope. So for example, one family member may be more prone to developing depression and another who might have more energy might be more prone to developing anxiety. Um, but one of the things that is kind of interesting is that research has found that those who struggle with depression may actually have altered patterns of stress hormone levels, AKA cortisol. Now, this is where um, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis really comes into play. And if you've had me for biopsychology, you've heard me talk about the HPA axis. So let me just kind of give you the shorthand version of it before I explain what's going on with people who are depressed. So the HPA axis basically works like this. When you encounter something that is stressful, the hypothalamus is basically going to signal to um, your pituitary gland that something stressful is happening. So what will happen is that the, um, the pituitary gland is basically, um, and the hypothalamus is going to release what is called corticotropin releasing factor or corticotropin releasing hormone. This is going to stimulate um, the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone from the pituitary gland. At that point, ACTH is going to facilitate the release of hormones, stress hormones like cortisol from the adrenal gland. Those, uh, those stress hormones make contact with areas like the hippocampus and bind in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus basically has the effect of working um, as kind of an off switch um, and cutting that cortisol production. So it's basically meant to be over the short term to be this negative feedback loop. So just a reminder, the hypothalamus releases corticotropin releasing hormone that stimulates the pituitary to release adrenocorticotropic hormone that stimulates uh, the adrenal glands to release things like cortisol, which then bind in the hippocampus and then basically cause that shutoff switch. So cortisol binding in the hippocampus is intended to be an inhibitory process. But in people who are 
are struggling with depression, we find that they have abnormal cortisol secretion. And usually their stress hormones are gonna be elevated. Additionally, we do find that people who are struggling with depression do have higher release of ACTH and corticotropic releasing hormone. And it's been suggested that this can happen for a couple of different reasons. First of all, there may just be abnormal regulation through the hypothalamus. And researchers have also found that exposure to trauma very early on in life or exposure to stress very early on in life makes the HPA axis over responsive in nature. So here you're actually looking at some abnormalities in glucocorticoid release or cortisol release. So um, each dot is basically representing one person. And uh, what I want you to kind of focus on are the differences in uh, normal controls, psychiatric controls, and depressed patients. So uh, you can see that for people who have other psychological conditions that are not uh, depression, you can, uh, and they'd probably not want to include anxiety in here for similar reasons, you can see that there's a lot of variability in the amount of cortisol. Now compare that to our psychiatric controls and normal controls. One thing that I will also note, I want you to note that while in general, uh, depressed patients are actually producing more cortisol than normal, there are some who are within a normal range. So that's that's kind of something to keep in mind. Now, here's kind of another way of looking at it. Um, it turns out that these uh, cortisol levels change throughout the day. So if we're talking about somebody who's not struggling with depression, um, so we're talking about clock time here. So uh, you can kind of see this is midnight, this is two o'clock in the morning, and you can see that while you're sleeping, especially as you're getting ready to start your day, those cortisol levels are beginning to rise. Um, they kind of peak around the time that you wake up, and then they just very naturally drop off throughout the day. Now, you kind of see that with patients that are struggling with depression as well, but what I really want you to notice is just the cortical release is consistently pretty much always higher than it is for people uh, without um, depression. Now, one other thing that you're looking at here, um, there is a drug called dexamethasone. It is a steroid. And one of the things that we know about dexamethasone is that um, some patients, um, dexamethasone actually cuts and reduces cortical, uh, cortisol release. So you might actually prescribe something like dexamethasone to reduce those cortisol levels. Now, what you're kind of seeing here in blue is a normal response. So somebody who gets dexamethasone, their cortisol release is low um, and stays low. Oops stays low for up to 24 hours after taking dexamethasone. One of the things that I really want to show you, here's your baseline data. Notice that for the most part, for depressed patients, some patients that struggle with depression actually do not have a depression of that cortisol, uh, suppression of that cortisol response. Um, and so one of the things that we know is that patients who are non-responsive to dexamethasone, like this particular patient is, um, they have a higher uh, probability of having a relapse of their depressive symptoms compared to people who demonstrate this normal suppressive response to cortisol. Now, one of the other things that we know that can really mess with cortisol is altered sleep patterns. So um, what you'll kind of notice here, you're looking at some data from a, a sleep pattern of a patient with depression. And we know that in general, compared to people who are not struggling with depression, what we generally are going to see is that they have a delayed onset of sleep. They take longer to fall asleep. They enter REM sleep. Uh, much earlier, which is here in red. 
um, and they tend to sleep less deeply. So sleep tends to occur in uh, four different stages. Um, and what you can kind of see is that there is no instance of stage three or four. It's pretty flat, except for the times when it goes into stage one. And there's also significantly more wakings. And we know that poor sleep also ha uh, can affect cortisol. Here's another example. So basically this is REM latency. So basically how long it takes you to enter REM sleep. So one of the things that we know with people with depression, they, they enter REM sleep much earlier. And what you can kind of see is that in general, they enter it much more quickly than people who are not depressed. And this was demonstrated across a variety of different age groups. So now we're going to talk about some of the neurochemical bases of these different mood disorders. So before we really get into this, we have to talk about the notion of depression being caused by a chemical imbalance. So this was something that became very popular in the mid 90s. So one of the things is that remember that previous generations were not as open about their mental health and may, under certain circumstances, have considered it a moral failing to potentially not be tough enough to handle the challenges of life. So one way to kind of make this a bit more acceptable to people who struggle with that mental health stigma is to go, well, it's not necessarily your fault, it's a chemical imbalance. And to be fair, that's not entirely incorrect. Um, when we talk about the notion of a chemical imbalance, we have to talk about what is sometimes referred to as the monoamine hypothesis of depression. And the reason that we call this the monoamine hypothesis, it's largely based on side effects of a drug that is called reserpin. Um, reserpin is often used to treat high blood pressure. But one of the things that we know is that reserpin for many patients has the side effect of basically producing depressed mood. And researchers were kind of interested in this because if you know anything about reserpin, basically what it does is it prevents monoamines, in particular dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin from being packaged into vesicles. That basically leaves these molecules of neurotransmitter in the cytoplasm where they're basically destroyed by monoamine oxidase. And so there was this idea that um, it's because of these neurotransmitters that depression is happening. So which neurotransmitter is the culprit? And researchers tried to figure it out. And one of the earliest things that they found was that dopamine's not really the culprit here. Um, dopamine's not the problem. Um, and that's because researchers would give um, subjects, they would give them things like cocaine or they would give them amphetamines, both of which are designed to increase dopamine. And what they found is that cocaine and amphetamine will absolutely give you a lot of energy, but it really won't necessarily change your mood. And so because of that, researchers really started eyeing norepinephrine and particularly serotonin. And we're going to spend some time later talking about the actions of monoamine oxidase inhibitors, known as MAOIs, and tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs, that both increase the function of norepinephrine and to a lesser, or norepinephrine and to a greater extent, serotonin. So the monoamine hypothesis very quickly became the serotonin hypothesis. And that's because um, serotonin is largely going to affect things like pain sensitivity, mood, eating, and response to both reward and negative events. So how do we figure out people's serotonin levels. And it turns out we have a variety of different ways to do this. One of the ways that researchers have looked at this, it's kind of hard to find serotonin in the moment, but what you can look for is what is called 5-HIAA. Um, 
And this is the major metabolite of serotonin. And researchers did actually find that they're compared to post-mortem controls. Um, people who struggled with depression, if you look at their post-mortem brains, they actually have significantly lower levels of this um, serotonin metabolite, indicating that they had lower circulating serotonin. Now, one of the things that you might be asking yourself is, well, uh, knockout mice, um, what would happen if you and I lacked serotonin? And uh, one of the ways that people have looked at this is by looking at knockout mice. And so basically they will genetically breed mice that cannot produce serotonin. And what they've ended up finding out is that knockout mice uh, that can't form serotonin are irritable, they're aggressive, and they're overly sensitive to pain. In addition to this, they show altered patterns of eating and getting that sense of fullness. And those kind of look very much like, um, those look very much like what we see in people struggling with depression. Now, if we wanna look at this in humans, there's actually a really cool way that we do this, and it's called a tryptophan depletion challenge. Basically, what you are going to do is you are going to consume a tryptophan deficient amino acid cocktail. And basically this amino acid cocktail is gonna reduce serotonin in the brain because remember, tryptophan is a serotonin precursor. So if you do not have tryptophan in that cocktail, it will temporarily lower levels of serotonin because more serotonin cannot be made. And what they've actually found when they give people this tryptophan depletion challenge is that um, it causes a relapse. So if you're looking at unmedicated patients that struggle with depression, they experience a relapse of their depressive symptoms. And um, people that um, have a family history of depression, but are not depressed themselves, also experience depressive symptoms. Now, what's interesting is that healthy, healthy participants who do not have a family history of depression do not show these effects. And one thing that I would just like to remind you, um, low levels of brain serotonin do not necessarily cause depression. Again, for healthy subjects that do not have a family history, temporarily having lower serotonin did not create depressive symptoms. So what this tells us is that some people might be more sensitive to low serotonin in the brain, and as a result, they are more vulnerable to developing depression. The other thing that has often been implicated is uh, what is referred to as serotonin reuptake. In particular, there is a gene that basically codes for the serotonin reuptake transporter. So when serotonin makes contact with a receptor, this reuptake transporter or CERT will basically pick serotonin back up, take it to the presynaptic cell where it can be recycled and used again. And it turns out that the gene that codes for the serotonin reuptake transporter has two different alleles. Um, it has a long allele and it has a short allele. And really what we know is that the short allele is associated with poorer reuptake. Um, and if you've had me for biopsych, we've talked a little bit about this. I showed many of you a graph where you either have people with two short alleles, one short allele, and one long allele, or two long alleles. And what we end up finding is that if you have two short alleles or one short allele, you are more likely to develop depression over time, but only if you are already exposed to stressful events. Now, one of the things that we do find as a result of serotonin in particular being a major power player in this is that most antidepressants that you encounter will either affect 
breakdown of serotonin or reuptake of serotonin. So most antidepressants are designed to increase serotonin uh, either by blocking reuptake of serotonin and allowing it to stay in the synapse for longer or by inhibiting monoamine oxidase. Now, one of the things that might kind of surprise you, if you have taken antidepressants, you have been told that you will need to take this for uh, three to four weeks before you really start to get noticeable effects. And that may make you wonder, is the drug actually doing anything prior to those three to four weeks? And what you can see is that for whatever reason, um, the effects of antidepressants are instantaneous upon serotonin. However, they don't, those effects have to build up over time before they create observable changes in depressed folks' mood or behavior. So chronic treatment will result in downregulation of autoreceptors. These are autoreceptors. Remember that their job is to uh, basically cut numbers of uh, to basically reduce serotonin, um, and it's going to increase uh, serotonin in the synapse, but to get maximum effect, there is going to be a delay. And this is one of the hardest things about taking antidepressants, is that while it starts working biologically right away, it's going to take three to four weeks before you really start feeling anything. And so as a result, it's really important to keep taking the medication even when you're not feeling anything early on. So here's what that chronic effect looks like. So kind of going back, you can kind of see we've had a slight reduction in the serotonin receptors, and in general, we're getting a major release of uh, serotonin into the synapse. Now, antidepressants may also affect norepinephrine. Researchers have regularly found that um, the beta receptor of norepinephrine does seem to play a major role. Researchers have found that when you take antidepressants over a longer period of time, there is a downregulation or reduction of those beta receptors. So this takes between 7 to 21 days of treatment, and this is um, a lag that is pretty similar to that delayed three to four week onset that we talked about. So some researchers have thought that the reason that the effect even though the effects on serotonin are instantaneous in terms of serotonin release, the reason it takes that three to four weeks is because of the reduction of those beta receptors. And thus, as a result, for some people, we have what is called the serotonin norepinephrine hypothesis. So we do actually find that there are a lot of different interactions between noradrenergic neurons in the locus coeruleus and serotonin. Uh, serotonin neurons in the raphe nuclei. And as we've already kind of seen, each system is kind of capable of modulating the other. So here you can see your norepinephrine pathway, your noradrenergic pathway, here's your locus coeruleus, and compare that to um, the raphe nuclei in a pretty similar spot to the um, locus coeruleus, but this is our serotonin pathway, and you can see that it is very equally widespread, and there's also a lot of overlap between these two pathways. So now let's talk about what brain areas are involved in depression. So patterns of activity in the brain are really complex. We know that there is reduced volume of the hippocampus in particular, largely because of those stress hormones binding in the, uh, in, um, in the hippocampus, in that HPA axis. And there are some other um, brain areas that are involved as well. Now, some regions are gonna have a reduced metabolic function and others are going to have increased functioning. So one of the major things that we see with depression 
is that you are more likely to have an amygdala that is overactive. So um, we do see increased amygdala activity to the point of overactivity. What you're looking at here is a PET scan. Again, remember that warmer colors mean more activity and cooler colors mean less. And what you can actually see is that we have um, increased activity, not just in the amygdala, but also in the orbitofrontal cortex. We know that it is the job of the orbitofrontal cortex to inhibit the amygdala. So if the amygdala is overactive, the orbitofrontal cortex may also become overactive in its attempt to inhibit the amygdala. And one of the things that we do find is that this increased amygdala activity is highly correlated with the severity of depression and how quickly or whether you can return to normal after antidepressant treatment. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about the HPA axis and the fact that depression in particular can knock the HPA axis off kilter and as a result, damage the hippocampus. This is what is known as the glucocorticoid hypothesis. Basically, um, the depression creates stress-related abnormalities in both the, the nervous system and in the endocrine system. So one of the things that we know is that the corticotropin-releasing hormones, uh, the neurons that release that in the hypothalamus, are normally going to be controlled by other areas. The amygdala kicks it off. And the hippocampus is basically the off switch. So the amygdala is kind of the on switch. And as we see, it's already overactive. The hippocampus is basically its off switch. And once glucocorticoids like cortisol bind to the hippocampus, that should effectively be creating an off switch. But one of the things that we know is that prolonged stress can actually damage brain cells. Prolonged stress hormones, um, prolonged stress or chronic stress can lead to high stress hormone levels. And depression is technically putting a lot of stress on the body. And this chronic stress and those high cortisol levels can damage and in some cases even destroy hippocampal cells. We do actually see in addition to damage to the hippocampus, we may also get damage to the prefrontal cortex. We see fewer dendritic branches and we see fewer dendritic spines. And additionally, the formation of new hippocampal cells is inhibited. So one of the things that we find with a lot of people that struggle with depression is they tend to have worse episodic memory because the hippocampus is largely responsible for that and it's being damaged. So like I said, what sort of things happen when hippocampal cells are damaged? The hippocampus will not be able to inhibit the HPA axis, so we're gonna get this vicious cycle of stress. But we do actually find that antidepressants can help with this. They reduce levels of corticotropin-releasing hormone, and they can reverse the loss of hippocampal dendrites when we're looking at animals. So what are some of the different treatments for mood disorders? And there are many different therapeutic approaches. So we have things like antidepressant drugs like MAOIs. We have tricyclic antidepressants. We have uh, second generation antidepressants like SSRIs. And we have third generation antidepressants, which may include things like atypical antipsychotics. We also have a variety of different non-drug therapies that I will not spend as much time on. Sleep deprivation, electroconvulsive therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation, and deep brain stimulation. So here are uh, some different classes of antidepressants and uh, some of their side effects. And again, this kind of cut off the slide. So we have um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, including things like phenylzine, tranylcypromine, and isocarboxazid. 
Um, and these will have side effects of things like insomnia, weight gain, high blood pressure, drug interactions, and something we'll call the cheese effect or the tyramine effect. We have classic tricyclics like imipramine, um, amitriptyline, and desipramine. These include things like sedation. Uh, we'll talk about this more, anticholinergic effects and cardiovascular toxicity. And then we'll talk about our second gens. Oftentimes, if you are going to be given an antidepressant, you are going to be given a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That could be fluoxetine or Prozac, sertraline or Zoloft, or paroxetine or Paxil. And you'll experience things like insomnia, gastrointestinal problems, sexual dysfunction, and uh, at its very worst, things like serotonin syndrome. So one of the things that's kind of hard, we've developed several different generations of uh, antidepressants, and generally there's no antidepressant that's been developed really since Prozac that has really been any more effective in managing the symptoms. So that's one of the things that's kind of hard about antidepressants just in general. Um, no one specific drug or drug type has really been shown to be more effective than any other. And there's no way to predict what type you will respond best to. So what this means, and this is the hard part, is that you're gonna have to try out different types. You might have to find a drug that optimally balances the effectiveness and the side effects. And that's why most people are given an SSRI to start. And that's because those tend to have fewer side effects because they only work on serotonin. Additionally, all of these require chronic, chronic administration. We've already talked about this, but there's a delay in when you start to get those therapeutic effects. So it's really important to keep taking them until it's about the time when you should see an effect. The nervous system needs time to actually compensate for all of these changes that are happening. So we're going to start by talking about MAO inhibitors. Uh, they prevent breakdown of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin by monoamine oxidase. So MAO basically metabolizes the monoamine neurotransmitters that are not contained in vesicles in those presynaptic terminals. So basically, this enzyme will basically destroy any neurotransmitter that is not in a vesicle. So if we inhibit this enzyme, this increases the amount of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine that's available for release. So here's what you can see here. So here's our MAOI, here is MAO, and you can see this is what it looks like when you take an MAOI. We have more dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine that can be released. Here's what it looks like under normal operating procedures. You can see there's very little, there's very few monoamines that are circulating outside of the vesicles. Now, here's what this looks like, kind of going back. So here's what this initially looks like acutely. Here's what it looks like over the long term. Um, here, we have more monoamine receptors. Notice that over time, because we have this increased release of neurotransmitters, the receptors um, have reduced and that you're, you're kind of seeing those longer term changes. Now, what are some of the different side effects of MAOIs? And one of the things that I will mention that um, here, um, the very first antidepressant was basically discovered by accident. It is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It is called ipronizid. Um, it was originally developed to treat tuberculosis, but people noted that it elevated mood. And as a result, ipronizid is the world's 
first antidepressant. Um, but MAOIs like Ipronizid and the other ones that were mentioned will do the following. You'll get changes in blood pressure, potentially sleep disturbances, um, overeating or weight gain, and we also have some more dangerous effects. Any drug that enhances norepinephrine function will have a more intense effect on the sympathetic nervous system. In particular, it is highly recommended, not even highly recommended, this is a must do, um, you need to avoid any foods that contain tyramine because if you eat them while you are taking an MAOI, you are going to spike your blood pressure to very high levels. Another thing that we know that MAOIs do is they inhibit liver enzymes, in particular those from the cytochrome P450 family. Now, if you're kind of curious about what you can't have when you take an MAOI, that includes a variety of different dairy, including unpasteurized milk and yogurt, aged cheese, and unfortunately, one of my favorites is cheddar, uh, no blue cheese, boar salt cheese, brick cheese, brie cheese, camembert, cheddar, Colby, Emmenthaler, Gouda, Gruyere, mozzarella, Parmesan, provolone, Romano, Roquefort, and Stilton. You also cannot have cured meats like aged game, liver, canned meat, yeast extract, salami, dry sausage, pickled fish like herring, cod, or caviar, and peanuts, which is not a meat, but there you go. Uh, bread, cereal, and grain, no yeasty bread or bread or crackers that contain cheese, um, Italian broad beans, no fermented foods like sauerkraut, no bananas, red plums, avocados, or raspberries, additionally, no alcoholic beverages, yeast concentrate, no soup cubes, no commercial gravies or meat extracts, or soups containing items um, that must be avoided or soy sauce or hoisin, which is also um, another type of sauce. So if you want to take MAOIs and you can handle these dietary restrictions, be my guest, but I for one love my bread, uh, my yeasty bread and my cheese. Now what about tricyclics? So tricyclics are named for their three ring structure. So you're actually looking at a few of these here. So we have uh, imipramine, which is sold under the trade name uh, Tofranil, amitriptyline, which is sold under the uh, name Elevil, and desipramine, which is sold under the name Norpramine. But one of the things that I want you to notice is they all have that three ring structure. And their job is to basically inhibit reuptake of, um, reuptake of neurotransmitters. Um, these were originally discovered, um, imipramine was basically used to test for antipsychotic effects but people actually found that it enhanced mood. So basically what it does, it inhibits reuptake of neurotransmitters, basically prolonging neurotransmitter action at the synapse and thus producing changes in pre and postsynaptic receptors. Um, it's pretty equally uh, effective in inhibiting reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. Um, here, you can kind of see, though, that despite the fact that tricyclics work on both, some work equally well, like vanitrip or amitriptyline, but notice that some work better on one neurotransmitter than the other. So, for example, Vivactyl and norepramine work better on norepinephrine. Anaphrenil, and, uh, anaphrenil works way better on serotonin. So it does kind of vary. And then notice, too, our SSRIs. Um, only Paxil works a little bit, has a mild effect on norepinephrine, but the most, the rest don't. Um, notice that SNRIs like Stratera and Erdinax don't work on serotonin at all. So there's going to be some variability there. Now, one of the other things that I have to mention about tricyclics is they don't just work on serotonin and norepinephrine. They block acetylcholine particularly the muscarinic receptors, they block histamine 
and they block beta receptors for norepinephrine. And so because it doesn't just work on serotonin and norepinephrine, it also works on acetylcholine and it also works on histamine. This is basically gonna cause a variety of different effects. So blocking histamine is going to cause sedation and fatigue. Um, so that's one issue. The other thing is the anticholinergic effects. Remember, it's blocking muscarinic receptors. So because of that, we're gonna, you may experience things like dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, dizziness, confusion, impaired memory, and blurred vision. And then because it works on, um, norepinephrine receptors, this can include dangerous cardiovascular effects at very high levels, including uh, orthostatic hypotension, basically feeling like you're going to pass out when you stand up, uh, tachycardia, and arrhythmias. One of the other things that I will mention, um, these drugs have a relatively low therapeutic index, um, so it's something to kind of be careful of um, because the fatalities occur at approximately 10 times the normal dose. And because of that, their therapeutic index is relatively low. These are ones that you do not want to abuse. So finally, let's talk a little bit about those second gen antidepressants. And generally, if you are gonna be put on an antidepressant, this is the one you're gonna be put on. So selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs block presynaptic serotonin reuptake transporters. And remember that the fewer neurotransmitters a drug works on, it is going to have fewer side effects. Um, but SSRIs can be used to treat panic disorders, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder. They have occasionally been used for treating obesity and alcohol use disorders. And they also, have side effects. They're not going to be as severe as what we saw with the tricyclics or the MAOIs, but the side effects may not be fun for people. Um, this includes things like anxiety, restlessness, movement disorders, muscle rigidity, nausea, headache, insomnia, and one that is particularly notable is sexual dysfunction. This may mean something like low libido or low sexual desire, or um, if you are um, assigned male at birth, it might mean erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. But uh, sexual dysfunction um, occurs in about 40 to 70% of all patients that take SSRIs, and it's commonly cited as a reason for quitting, particularly with male patients. Um, now, one thing that I will mention that you have to watch out for um, with SSRIs is serotonin syndrome. Um, this is basically um, when Drugs that also enhance serotonin are combined with SSRIs. So you're getting too much serotonin. So that might be if you're taking ecstasy while you're taking an SSRI. Um, you'll experience severe agitation, disorientation, confusion, ataxia, muscle spasms, um, exaggerated autonomic nervous system function, including fever, shivering, chills, diarrhea, high blood pressure, and high heart rate. Um, one other thing that I will mention is that for adolescents and young adults taking um, SSRIs, in particular fluoxetine or Prozac, there is what is called a black box warning. Um, it contains a black box warning because there is research that has shown that uh, taking Prozac can increase suicidality or suicidal ideation in um, young adult or adolescent patients that are taking it. And the FDA has considered this so important that this warning is put on a black box for anybody who is taking Prozac or fluoxetine. So that's something to be aware of too. If you're younger, there is a slight, there is an increased risk for suicidal ideation or even dying by suicide while you take it. Now, what about the non-drug therapies? One of the things that we know is that physical activity may potentially help. Um, 
Now, I'm not saying it's a cure, and I'm not saying that anybody who is struggling with depression needs to go for a run. But we do actually find that in animal studies, uh, running actually did reverse the depressant effects of administering stress hormones. I saw a review last year that actually showed that dancing was the best exercise of all for this. Um, and researchers have found that physical activity does increase the growth of new hippocampal cells, as well as their dendritic length and their spine density. Now, what about treatments for bipolar disorder? Um, your book is going to talk about a few other treatments, but lithium carbonate is going to be the most effective medication because it can eliminate or reduce manic episodes without causing depression or producing sedation. It's especially effective in reducing suicide in bipolar individuals. So here you can kind of see a time. It also can reduce the time between episodes. So here we have time between episodes in year. You can see without lithium, you can see manic and depressive episodes are occurring once a year. You can kind of see though that for people that are continuously taking lithium, that manic episode actually uh, can maybe only occur every nine years. And it may also affect depression and slow down how often depressive episodes happen as well. So how does lithium work? Lithium enhances serotonin actions. In particular, uh, they found that it elevates brain tryptophan, serotonin, and the uh, serotonin metabolite, and it does increase serotonin release. It also uh, reduces catecholamine activity, in particular norepinephrine and dopamine, by enhancing reuptake and reducing their release but it can be dangerous. Much like we saw with the tricyclics, the therapeutic index is very low. Blood levels of lithium have to be monitored on a regular basis. You are initially going to take a higher dose to start with, and then um, when you're initially starting lithium, over time, they can reduce that dose. Um, with side effects, you will experience things like increased thirst and urination, um, impaired concentration, memory, fatigue, tremor, and weight gain. Higher doses can lead to coma and even death. There are some different alternatives to lithium. Um, there's valproate or Depakote. It is an anticonvulsant approved for treating mania, and that's largely because it's increasing GABA, which is inhibitory. It also can affect and reduce uh, dopamine and glutamate neurotransmission. Its effectiveness is similar to lithium, um, but the side effects are going to be different, and it is teratin. Uh, teratogenic, so you want to limit its use um, in women who are of childbearing age. We also have Tegretol, um, which is under the name, um, Tegretol is the brand name for carbamazepine. It is also an anticonvulsant. It looks a lot like tricyclic antidepressants, and it also inhibits norepinephrine uptake. It also blocks adenosine receptors, much like we see with caffeine, and upregulates them. Um, interestingly enough, again, the time course and the extent of effectiveness are similar to those of lithium, but the side effects are going to be a little bit different. So you can see here um, carbamazepine, Tegretol here in blue, and here's lithium. And notice that um, you can see that lithium works well initially, but carbamazepine eventually does drop to lithium-like levels after about three weeks of treatment. So folks, that is it for this week. I will see you next week to finish up our course and talk about treatments for anxiety disorders and schizophrenia. Bye.